Well, hey, good morning, everybody. So good to see you all and to worship with you this morning. What a great morning it's already been. We're in the second week of the series called Relational Vampires. And the heart behind this series is that we are called as Christians to love others because God first loved us. But I think every one of us would probably agree there are some people that are just a little bit harder to love than others. Anybody identify with that? There's some people that are just kind of challenging to be around. And really the reason for this title is that what does a vampire do? They suck your blood, right? And so relational vampires are those people that suck the life out of you. They, they're just kind of de-energizing. And the other thing about vampires is that when you get bit by a vampire, you turn into one. And so sometimes when we're around these people that are challenging, that have some negative characteristics going on, we suddenly find that we have become one of them. So the heart behind this series is to help us figure out how do we respond to those challenging people in our life. So if you were here last week, we talked about critical people and something amazing happened. We got no criticism last week. It was amazing. <laughs> so just really appreciate you listening up and let's just continue that on. So, but my question for you right now is, do you know any hypocrites? Raise your hand if you know a hypocrite. Anyone? All right, a few of you. Now, who is sitting next to a hypocrite? No, I'm just kidding. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't do that. Friday morning, I was sitting around with my kids before school starts. It's kind of my job to make sure they get on the bus and get to where they need to go. And we're sitting around. We're not hardly awake and we, uh, we're trying to eat breakfast and just kind of make sure that everything is getting done. And I look over and my son Soren is on his iPad. And suddenly I thought, you know, we had just had this conversation where we had decided we weren't going to have electronics in the morning because they just kind of get in the way. They're too distracting. We should be talking to each other. And so I see him on YouTube and I said, like, Soren, what's going on? Why are you watching YouTube? I thought we weren't going to have electronics. And he looked back at me with this look. I'm like, what kind of look is that? It was kind of like this smirk almost. And suddenly it dawned on me what was happening. You see, I was telling him to get off his electronics as I was sitting there like this. <laughs> Have you ever had those moments when you say one thing and you do something else and you don't even realize it maybe? I think all of us probably have those times in our life. Well, Jesus tells a story that really applies to this topic. It's in the Gospel of Luke chapter 18. So if you have a Bible, I'd invite you to turn there. Luke chapter 18, starting with verse 9. You can grab your phone, grab your tablet, go to the YouVersion app, or grab a Bible in front of you. Luke chapter 18, starting with verse 9. And it says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted now, you see, we have another story. These show up numerous times throughout the Gospels where there's these two different groups of people that are lifted up, and we have to put ourselves in the thinking of a first century audience where there is one group that is always the hero. It's always the Pharisees. They're exemplary people. They're always devout. They do the right thing at all times. They are the picture, the poster children for what it means to be a follower of God. Meanwhile, we have a tax collector who was the lowest of the low, despised by everyone. He was seen as a traitor to his own people. And so we have this story playing out, and everybody thinks they know what's going to happen. They're pretty sure how the narrative 
should play out and how it should end. You see, the Pharisee was the one person who could stand in the temple and he could honestly say, thank you, I'm not like everyone else. And he would actually mean it. And the people around him would say, yeah, that's right. I mean, he followed all the rules. It says he fasted twice a week, which was double as much as you were required to do as a Pharisee. He gives away a tenth of his money, but probably even more. And he wants everyone to know it. But here comes this tax collector in on the Sabbath to the temple, and he's not even sure that he can step foot in this place. He's so ashamed of himself. He's comparing himself to this Pharisee, and so he's off in the shadows, kind of standing up against a wall. He doesn't feel worthy to even be in the Pharisee's presence. Because you see, the tax collector was the lowest of the low. What a tax collector would do is they would bid on part of the city, a region of the community. And once they were the highest bidder, they had the right to go and tax the people as much as the market could bear. And of course, they're going to push the limits upwards and upwards. If you wanted to open a business or you even wanted to conduct any type of commerce, you would have to go find that region's tax collector and go and make sure they were taken care of first. Now, they also had to give a portion of their profits to the Romans, so they were seen as traitors to their own people, the lowest of the low, the most hated people around. Now, if there were two candidates for political office, and one was a Pharisee and one was a tax collector, it wouldn't even be close. Everybody would vote for the Pharisee. Or take it this way, if, if both of these men showed up at your door and they wanted to date your daughter, there's only one of them that you would give permission to. For sure you would let your daughter date a Pharisee, but never a tax collector. But in this story, like he so often does, Jesus flips everything around. And everything that the crowd was assuming is turned around. You see, Jesus always gets to the heart of the matter, and in this situation, the heart of the matter is the heart of people. The Pharisee did all the right things, but he had all the wrong motives. His religious devotion was purely external and not internal. He's trying to impress people, but not impress God. And he's not in the temple so much to pray as to proclaim his greatness so that everybody else can hear him. They can overhear everything he says. It's all about him and not really at all about God. You see, the Pharisee's sin is not so much that he's conceited or that he's looking down on people, that he's got a big ego. The Pharisee's sin is that he's a hypocrite. His heart doesn't match his actions. The tax collector, on the other hand, he recognizes his own sin. He's overwhelmed by his sin and his need for God's mercy. And he simply focuses on his own shortcomings. He doesn't pretend like he has it all together. Instead, in desperation, he cries out to God. Now, while the tax collector's outward conduct is questionable, I mean, everybody sees how he conducts his business. In the end, we see he's the one with his heart in the right place. And Jesus concludes the story by saying only one of these men is justified in God's eyes. It means they're made righteous in God's eyes. And while the crowd would have assumed that it was going to be the Pharisee, it's the tax collector. The tax collector is the one who is made right with God because of his heart. The tax collector is the one that's lifted up as the example. This is unheard of. But it should challenge each one of us as we consider our own faith and our own walk with Jesus. The number one complaint that non-Christians have about Christians as polls have been done over the last couple decades, the number one complaint from non-Christians about Christians is that we are too hypocritical. See, I think it's tragic that one of the main reasons, one of the main barriers that non-Christians don't come to faith is because of Christians. 
If you talk to someone who's decided, you know, I'm not going to go to church. I don't want any part of this. I don't want to be a church person. It's oftentimes because they know too many church persons. Similarly, if someone is asked, you know, hey, why don't you read your Bible? Sometimes the response is something like, well, I know a lot of people who read their Bible even every day. And some of those people are the meanest people I have ever met. It's tragic when the reason that people don't come to faith is because of Christians. You know, Gandhi was said to have met with a missionary one day. And the missionary shared their faith and shared the gospel clearly. And Gandhi famously responded, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians because they are so unlike your Christ. There was also another study that was done that said out of a pool of non-believers, 84% of them know a Christian really well. They have a relationship, a friendship with someone who is a believer, 84%. But the same study said that only 14% of them said they saw any difference in how their Christian and non-Christian friends conducted their life. There's also statistics that say that there is no statistical difference between Christians and non-Christians engaging in harmful behavior. When it comes to gambling, getting drunk, visiting adult websites, gossiping, cheating, divorce, the list goes on and on. There is no difference statistically between Christians and non-Christians engaging in those behaviors. It's no wonder that Christians are so often looked at as hypocrites. I mean, we talk a big game, but so often we don't live it out. Now, as you may know, the word hypocrite originated way before Jesus' time. Actually, it was a part of Greek theater. It was the word that described a stage actor. And what it literally means is a person who wears a mask. Think about how often in our everyday life we end up wearing a mask, pretending to be someone we're not. Hypocrisy is when there is a gap between what we say and how we live. Or another way to think about it, it's a gap between what we show to the world and who we really are on the inside. It's so easy to say one thing and then to do another, to pretend to be someone you're not. Now the reason this is so important to talk about, and I know it's not an easy topic, But the reason this is so important to talk about is that Jesus talks so harshly about hypocrites. In fact, more harshly than he talks about any other group of people. In Matthew chapter 23, seven different times he says, woe to you who are hypocrites. And in verse 28 he says, outwardly you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Right before this, he says, you are like a whitewashed tomb. I mean, it's just this pretty gravesite. But he said, inside, you're just filled with bones and filth. It's easy to put on a good show, but to not have your heart line up with how you, what you're acting. Now, we could probably all think of examples that we've encountered in our life. People that we would say, yeah, this person is acting like a hypocrite. It might be someone you see at church every single week, faithful at worship. Maybe they're active in ministries. But everybody knows kind of behind the scenes that they're cheating on their wife or they're mistreating their kids. But everybody's too nervous to say anything about it. Maybe it's a youth who comes to youth group and they talk about how much they love Jesus. And then on the weekend, they are the biggest partier in the entire school. Maybe it's a businessman who's gone to Bible study faithfully for decades, but yet in the workplace, they have very little integrity and they treat their workers horribly. I think every one of us has encountered hypocrites. But then we have to be honest with ourselves that every one of us also has acted like a hypocrite. 
Every one of us falls short in so many different ways. And we try to say one thing and we end up doing another. And so it's so important to know how to respond when we come face to face with hypocrisy. As Christians, what are we called to do? What's our steps? What, what do we do when we come face to face with hypocrisy in someone else's life or in our own? Well, I think the first place we need to go is we need to ask the question of why. What's behind this? Why are they or why are we acting like this? Because when we understand why, it helps us understand better how to go forward and respond. So I think there are three key questions we should ask when we come face to face with hypocrisy. And the first question is, do they really know Jesus? 1 John 2, 4 says, whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person. See, the reality is just because you go to church, just because you serve in a ministry, just because you open your Bible or you join a small group doesn't necessarily mean you have a saving relationship with Jesus. Ephesians tells us we are saved by grace through faith and it's not by anything that you do. It's all about the posture of our heart. It's not about what we do that saves us. Jesus says this really stark thing in the Gospels. He says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who calls out to him will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not just about what you do. It's about whether you have believed and trusted him with your life. See, the question is, if you come across a hypocrite or you're struggling with that yourself, is do you just know about Jesus or do you actually know Jesus? When you have a friend or a family member who's maybe struggling with lining their, what they say and what they do up, do they just know about Jesus or do they actually know him? Do they have a saving relationship with him? It's the first question to ask. Number two, do they know any better? Paul says, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. You know, sometimes people make bad decisions, they take the wrong path, they say the wrong thing because they don't know any better. What we say around here is that following Jesus is a growing experience. And it means whether you're following Jesus for 95 years or 95 minutes, there is still another step you can take. Every one of us should be growing in our faith until one day we graduate and get to go be with him forever. There's always another step. It's always a growth process. And what that means is that there are some people when they're new to faith who are like an infant, like Paul says. Infants start out by crawling, right? And eventually they start to toddle and they were able to walk and then eventually they can run. And that's what a faith journey is like. First we have to crawl, then we can walk and then we run. And so sometimes there's people who make these bad decisions. We might wonder, well, why are they still using such crude language? I mean, why are they out partying so much? Well, it might be because they're new in the faith. They just don't know any better. I remember being at a youth retreat many years ago. We were having this incredible worship time, and everybody's jazzed, and there's so much excitement. And we ended up praying together, and people were praying these bold prayers, and Everybody's kind of getting into it and saying amen, and finally one girl just shouts out an expletive, and we're all like, whoa, it was like, you know, the record going off the record player. Now, in that moment, we could have said, what's the matter with you, and tried to shame her and guilt her, but that's not the proper response, right? She was new to the faith. She didn't know what was uh, good to do and what wasn't, and so we had to see ourselves more as instructors instead of correctors. You know, too often I think we just want to be correctors. And we want to go and try to tell people what to do. Instead, we need to come alongside in love and grace. You know, church, if we don't have people in our midst here at Calvary making mistakes along the way, then we're not fulfilling our mission. Our hope is that there are people here that don't know how to behave. They don't know when to stand up or sit down. They don't know why we do three songs or not. And they don't know different elements in the service. That's a good sign that we're actually fulfilling our mission to reach people with the gospel. If we just look down on them or we judge them behind their backs, 
well, then we aren't going to reach anyone with the gospel at all. Following Jesus is a growing experience. And so sometimes when we come face to face with hypocrisy, it's because the person doesn't know better. Number three, do they know better but still choose to disobey? 1 Peter 2.16 says, For you are free, yet you are God's slaves or God's servants. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. You see, in the New Testament church, there was this problem because they had heard the good news of how Jesus died and he rose again and they had forgiveness for their sins and there was this amazing grace and mercy. And so a lot of people started to figure, well, like, we can go live it up and do whatever we want and then we'll just go ask for, for, for forgiveness later. You know, it gives us license to go do whatever we want. And Paul has to keep telling them, that's not the proper response at all. Jesus, yes, is graceful and he's merciful and he's loving. But we should want to follow him closely and to obey him out of a response. You know, I think we get really good sometimes at justifying our behavior and say, well, you know what, I deserve it or I know what I'm doing or I'm in control. Now, have you ever noticed how oftentimes we hold other people to a higher standard than ourselves? You know, like, well, they can't handle this, you know, like, they probably should keep a rein on these things. But, you know, I know myself, and so I can do this, I have more freedom. You know, I can watch that show, you know, there's not great values, but I can handle it, I'm mature enough. Or, you know, I'm really not that greedy or materialistic, you know, I just deserve to use my money for myself. Or, you know, I don't have a problem with gambling or drugs or alcohol. I mean, I know my limits, other people probably can't handle, handle it. But again, you see, when we're truly following Jesus, we want to obey him. Not to score points, but out of gratefulness for what he's done. Not out of obligation. Because we believe his ways are the best ways. Because we're grateful for his grace. So the third question, do, do you or do they know better but still choose to disobey? When we consider our own lives, our own choices, our own sins, which one of these three categories do we fall into? How about when we're encountering others? Now, when people fall into those first two categories, well, our mission is clear. It's to go and help disciple them, point them back to Jesus, come alongside them and help them grow in faith. But it's when we come into that third category, when we're face to face with hypocrisy, we need to take action. Because as we've said, hypocrisy not only hurts us personally, hypocrisy hurts our witness as a church. So sometimes as followers of Jesus, we're called to confront hypocrisy head on. And I know that sounds super scary, especially to all of us Midwesterners and Scandinavians, right? I mean, usually our default is, well, it's none of my business. Or, you know, I really, really hate confrontation, so I'm just going to ignore it. But as you read through scripture, the prophets in the Old Testament, Peter and Paul, Jesus, and the list goes on, they were all willing to go and confront hypocrisy. And so it's something we need to do very carefully, prayerfully, and always led by the Spirit. So I think there are three important things to remember. First of all, always, always remember the goal should be restoration. The goal should always be restoration. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Restore that person gently. I love the New Living Translation that says, Gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And it's a perfect image for what we're called to do. We are not called to be the judge and we're certainly not called to be the executioner. No, we're called to be a guide, to take them by the hand and to gently help them get back on the right path, to do it out of love and mercy and grace, just like God treats us with. Your goal is not to make a point. Your goal is not to bring shame and guilt on someone. It's to have a heart of love and compassion, a desire to help them get back on the path, I mean, remember the story of when Jesus comes across that woman who's been accused of adultery, and she's surrounded by this group of men, and they all have huge rocks, and they're ready to stone her to death. And Jesus comes, and he starts to write in the dirt, 
And he asks them a question. He says, are any of you without sin? Because if you are, then you can throw the first stone. And they all quickly drop their rocks and they walk away. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He helps comfort this woman. And he says, I don't condemn you. I'm not here to make you feel worse about yourself. I mean, you already have lived it. But he says, now, with my help, go and sin no more. You see, Jesus is perfectly full of grace and truth. And his goal is always to restore. It's always to get us back on track. So never forget, the goal should always be restoration. Now, if you feel like you're going to go correct someone because you want to put them in their place, you want them to feel ashamed, you need to check your own heart first. It's always, always about restoration. It's always about preserving the relationship. Number two, always confront very carefully. The second part of Galatians 6.1 says, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. See, Paul knows there's a huge temptation when we go and try to help someone get back on track that we can be filled with pride. We can feel arrogant, think we have it all together. We're super Christian. We got to tell this person how to live. We need to be so, so careful of this because too often we hear stories of someone who makes one sin their crusade and then suddenly it's found out that they themselves are engaged in that exact same sin. Be so, so careful when you step in to confront and to help someone. Now Jesus gives us some very helpful instructions in Matthew 18 on how to confront somebody carefully with a heart for restoration. So in Matthew 18, starting with verse 15, he says, if your brother or sister sins, pause there for a second, because that's key. If your brother or sister in the faith, someone else in the body of Christ, that's the first qualification. It means we shouldn't be crusaders that go out and try to tell every non-Christian what we think of them. Because the rules always follow the relationship, right? We've talked about this before. The rules always follow the relationship. I don't go to my next door neighbor and put his kids to bed when I put my kids to bed, right? That's not my role. They don't have to live by my rules. They're not part of my family. As the body of Christ, we need to be careful about this, to hold each other to account. But it should be no surprise that people who aren't in the body of Christ don't live by Jesus' standards. The rules always follow the relationship. And I think that's precisely why Jesus never spent much time passing laws to try to enact his principles. It's not the way he did it. It's by relationship. It's by changing hearts. And that's why as a church, we like to say, we want to be a place where you can belong before you believe. You don't have to follow all the rules before you can be a part of this community. We want you to come and establish a relationship first. The rules always follow So Matthew 18, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, but just between the two of you. It doesn't say go post it on Facebook for everyone to see. It doesn't say go call all your network of people and gossip behind their back. No, it's a private matter between the two of you. And Jesus says, if they listen to you, then you've won them over. He goes on and he says, if it doesn't work, then grab one more person or two more people to come with you with a heart for restoration and grace. And if that doesn't work, bring them to the church. And if that doesn't work, then he says you need to redefine your relationship. You need to set new boundaries. But we should always, always confront carefully. And then number three, and most importantly, we need to be asking God, God, help me to see where I'm the hypocrite. The classic story in the Bible is King David the powerful warrior king, the man after God's own heart, but he has an affair, he commits adultery with Bathsheba, and he doesn't just leave it there, he kills her husband, Uriah, and he figures he's covered it all up, he brings Bathsheba to be his wife. He's so powerful, nobody's gonna say anything. About a year goes by, and suddenly Nathan, the prophet, shows up, and he tells him a story, just randomly. 
He says there's this rich man who's traveling, and he comes and he, he stays in the house of this poor man. And he takes the poor man's pet lamb, and he barbecues it. And David is furious. How could you do that to his pet lamb? In fact, I want to do the same thing to that guy. He should be put to death. And Nathan simply looks him in the eyes. And he says, you're just like that man. You're just like him. David was caught in his hypocrisy. Oftentimes, what you're condemning the most is a reflection of where you're the most vulnerable. When you critique other people, be so careful that you aren't just covering up your own struggles. Remember, Jesus tells this story in Matthew 7. He says, be careful about looking for specks of dust in other people's lives when you have a two-by-four in your own. If you designate yourself to be the speck inspector, you better make sure you don't have a huge log or a huge two-by-four sticking out for everyone to see. You see, every day, we need to be more like the tax collector who turns to God for mercy and forgiveness. Every single one of us, no matter who we are, falls short of God's glory every single day. Every single one of us fails at truly representing Jesus the way that we should. But there's power and there's hope when we're willing to admit that. So here's the bottom line, church. Jesus has no tolerance for hypocrites. Jesus has no tolerance for hypocrites. But he has unlimited grace for a sinner in need of forgiveness. We can't fix other people. We can't even fix ourselves. But Jesus can. It's why he went to the cross and why he rose again. He defeated death and sin and evil once and for all. So that sinners, just like the tax collector and like us, could have hope and could have new life in him. So let's help each other. Let's point each other back to Jesus. Let's help each other get back on the path when we need to. But let's always do it out of a heart of love and grace so that we can better represent Jesus in the world so that more people will be attracted to his church and so that more people will enter the kingdom. Will you pray with me?